from the Catholic Underground. Today, today on the show, that old rose chestnut, startups you didn't expect, natural family planning and millennials, evangelizing on campus and caroling while doing so, our picks of the week and so much more. The Catholic Underground starts right now. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's time for the Catholic Underground, your weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent. It's episode number 282. I am Father Chris Decker. If you're listening live, you can join us at catholicunderground.tv and get your chat on. Joining me this week, we've got Father Ryan Humphreys. He joins us from the minor Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in historic Natchitoches, Louisiana, where he is the Father Rector. Hello, Father Ryan. It is my distinct pleasure to see you, Father Chris. Oh, yes. It's very kind of you. Also, yes, right. <laughs> Kathleen Lee. <laughs> She is the uh, campus minister at St. Michael the Archangel High School in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. She is our fully licensed faith ninja, and um, and she also knows the true meaning of parappa pum pum. Yes, I do. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And Jeff Blackwell, uh, who is the quintessential drummer boy, he is the technical director of the CU. He is the commandant of the Jeff Star One <laughs> near Earth Orbit Satellite. We didn't put a drum set up there for a reason. Hello, Jeff. <laughs> oh, and I wore a tie for our radio listeners today. He did. Okay. Yes, indeed. It's uh, it's one of those that that looks like it could be edible, actually. Um, <laughs> well, like a sure. candy cane. Like a candy. And this episode of CU is brought to you in. Living color. It is. It yeah. totally is. That's right. Um, and not exactly Technicolor, because some of uh, some of the the highlights in Kathleen's hair could not be replicated on camera. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but there are a couple of uh, special guests that are that are part of our family that are yes. here uh, in this advent. Of course, we know one that, that's regular, uh, Ed Ball, who uh, is doing our our video as he often is. So if you're in the chat room at CatholicUnderground.tv, or if you're watching us on Catholic Life TV or St. Michael Broadcasting. Uh, it's Ed that you have to thank for making sure that it's just not a camera stuck on me the whole time because Kathleen wouldn't wouldn't have it. I wouldn't. That's true. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> but we also have, uh, you might remember this name, Tim the Sim, uh, seminarian intern. He is actually, uh, he's finished with exams. And so Tim is uh, is watching there in the video cave uh, over the, the ever-vigilant shoulder of Ed. Yeah, he's like I, that brother that's come back from college because he literally has. He is. Yeah, that's Yay! true. Yeah, that's right. So, so we're happy to have uh, to have Tim the Sem uh, interning, getting Ed coffee there in the uh, in the video room. Well, Father Ryan, it is Rose Sunday. I put my rose on, or at least the um, the equivocal uh, uh, color that I have, which is maybe a little bit more pink than it is rose. But we talk about this every year because it's one of those liturgical colors that often goes unnoticed in the ordo. Yeah, I gave my entire sermon this week about the details and the value of details and love and the details. And and this is one of only two Sundays where you can wear a vestment that is not one of the typical colors. And that rose vestment is symbolic of a little island of joy, mm. which is the before you make the last real spiritual push toward the celebration of in this case, Christmas. Right. And it's a bigger deal for us for Easter because we still take Lent seriously in the West. Most of us nowadays, though, have been Christmasified for the last three weeks, so it's harder to get into the Rose Sunday in, uh, in, in Advent. You know, Christmasified? Yeah, Christmasified. Yeah, I guess it works okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's a be- Whedon word. <laughs> it's better than being Christmasive of the season. But a Oh, wow. See, see that one? Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I really enjoy this time of year, and I did something that I I haven't done. I, I don't know if you remember Father Ryan when we were at uh, Saint Joseph Abbey, and it was uh, darn near illegal to play any Christmas music in the halls. Yes, because the what? abbot had a particular the abbot uh, of the of the Benedictine Abbey where we were um, was is uh, a very uh, he's a he's a liturgist. Mm, and okay. Jeff, you know the difference between a liturgist and a terrorist. <laughs> No, I don't. You can negotiate with a terrorist. Oh, see. <laughs> and so, and so, and so, we were generally not allowed to uh, to play um, uh, Christmas music unless it was Advent music. Wow! And I did uh-huh. the, for the first time in a while, just because my November was so um, you know up in the air, egg mm-hmm. all over my face, just one of those months. I actually have have turned on the satellite radio Christmas channel a couple of times. Mm. Um, you know, but I guess part of it is uh, outside of the liturgy. I think you're right, Father Ryan. I haven't felt a whole lot of um, of longing. You know, mm-hmm. just yeah. because I've been so busy and, and yeah. life has been so kind of at a fever pitch. 
that in those moments in my car, when I wasn't praying the rosary or, or heading to or from the hospital for a hospital call or something, uh, I said, you know, I want to put on the Christmas music because I, I need to yeah. connect with a sense of longing. And, and, and sometimes those, those feel-good songs can actually do that. Sure. Yeah. You know, sometimes that emotion can be important, even though we're not, you know, right on about uh, all emotional all the time. Yeah. Because yeah. that's one of the things I don't like. Father Ryan, did you notice that whenever you were shopping on the Amazon, there is a little uh, a little gift uh, box you can click so that you can have Christmas shopping music while you're online? I didn't notice that. I hadn't yeah. noticed that either. It, it, would, it would have made me very sad had I noticed that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. Some, somewhere... Father Ryan and Lady Bird Johnson are crying. I am crying. Ew. I, I'm, I'm, I'm next to that Indian guy who's weeping because of the litter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yes. you got Lady Bird Johnson. Now the Native Americans are crying and Father Ryan, all because of the Christmasifying that has, you know, no oh, Christmas. It's a snowflake with a Christmas with a musical note on it. Why would they do that, Father Chris? Well, because you're not in the big box store. You're in the virtual big box store. Mm. Why would they do that, Father Chris? <laughs> well, I'm glad. I'm glad you asked, son. What makes this night different than every other night? <laughs> Gather around the old campfire and let Father Chris tell you why they do nasty <laughs> things like that. So, in addition to wearing the rose vestments, golly, it's only six minutes in, folks. Uh, I mean, really. Uh, uh, the O antiphons begin this week. And I, I, if there is something that really quickens the blood in prayer, for me, it is the O antiphons. And, um, and unless you pray the Liturgy of the Hours, and occasionally if you go to Mass, you'll hear them uh, during the week. But the O antiphons are the different names for, uh, for Jesus, essentially, for the Messiah, and all of the things that the prophets call him, and all the things that we know him to be. And the O antiphons go before uh, the Magnificat every, every day uh, from Wednesday up until Christmas Eve, um, so that we have kind of a way to, uh, to kind of couch the Magnificat, that great hymn of Our Lady that occurs in evening prayer and vespers. And uh, they all have uh, musical settings, Father, which I don't know if I know any of the musical settings themselves. Well, the, the one that most of us know is the uh, adaptation to him that has been called O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Oh, yes. And each of the different verses of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel is actually in reverse order um, of these. We, 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 what we can technically call the circumlocutions of the tetragrammaton. Yeah. That what? is the $56 word. Um, and if you can <laughs> say that to someone, you go, oh, I was just meditating upon the circumlocutions of the tetragrammaton. Yeah. You will seem unimaginably <laughs> intelligent. Um, but but these O antiphons, this is the, one of the reasons I miss living in a monastery, because you really get into the liturgical sense and you start to really start to appreciate and long for these certain musical moments. And like when you get to O Sapiensi on December 17th, O Wisdom, mm -hmm. and and the, the chant setting of it is quite long, quite intricate, and it's it starts almost a different season that we call late Advent. Mm -hmm. And it's it's as if everything suddenly changes. And all of a sudden, you're no longer kind of in more of a penitential mode, and now you're in really a waiting and anticipating yeah. and salivating mode. And the music changes dramatically. And we don't have this anymore because we don't have Gregorian chant the way we're supposed to, Vatican II says. But if you had the Gregorian chant, you see almost instantly this shift from very simple psalm tone based stuff yeah. to this incredible ornate sense of stuff. And, and it, it makes it incredible yeah. for the soul to kind of shift and you go, something has changed that you can't get when you're singing on Jordan's bank, you know, week after week. It, mm. It's just not something you can do with the way that we have mass now with the hymnody and things like that. And, I, and I've got to tell you, I love the notion, or I like a lot, the notion of liturgical salivation. <laughs> you know, just this note that this note, and, and maybe it's, it's somewhat resonant of what I experienced just in this busy month. Yeah. That I said, okay, I've got to, I've got to do the nearest thing I can think of in my car, to to kind of at least get my heart moving in the right direction. And so mm -hmm. I turned it on the least sappy uh, Christmas uh, channel I could find on the satellite radio. You know, um, some of the more the, the more classical holiday uh, hymns, and right. and that in a kind of a secular sense did for me in my own little personal prayer time there um, what the liturgy is designed to do. It's designed to, to bring our hearts somewhere to the point where we are right on the cusp of Christmas and we are, we are quite very much so salivating, 
Lord, come now, mm-hmm. please, mm-hmm. please come to us. Kathleen, do you like the idea of liturgical salvation for our salvation? I do. And I don't think, you uh, you know, like we've been saying it so much, I don't think we we always get that. Yeah. You know, in, in this Advent season. And so, this, you know, that's why in the past couple of Advent seasons, it's been really important for yeah. me to get there. That's right. Especially part of it is when you work for the church, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It can mm-hmm. be it can oh. be more difficult yeah. to find those instances because um, it, it's kind of like uh, if, if I can use the the uh, the theatrical uh, parlance, whenever you put on the show, yeah. you don't get to see the show. Mm-hmm. Uh. Right. And lit- liturgy is different in the sense that you can, as a priest or as a as a minister of, of you know whatever you're you're doing in the liturgy, um, you can enter into it. But the way that you enter into it is qualitatively different than as a person, as a congregant who's who's sitting there. You know, um, whenever whenever anyone like a priest um, celebrates the liturgy, it's very different. And so it, it is. It's mm. it's something. It's something. I don't know, Father. Does that resonate a little bit? Oh, it definitely does. I mean, that's one of the struggles that uh, that I've had with the traditional Latin Mass is I love to celebrate it, but I never get to attend it. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and there are so many priests I know, and I'm like, oh, you want to come say the Old Mass? And they're like, no, I want to attend the Old Mass. You just mm-hmm. know when you're saying it. Because it's such a rare thing, and, and it's incredibly beautiful. And um, one of the things that I'm very thankful for in, in modern technology is actually Spotify. Yeah. Because Spotify has several, and I just shared one in the show notes, an actual... Uh, CDs and and uh, and music of the O antiphon yes. within the context of Vespers, and I'm sharing one uh, that was produced by Dean Seuss, no relation, um, <laughs> called the Great O Antiphons, and he basically just walks through the different chants appropriate to the old antiphons, nice. and it's remarkable. And man, is it just so nice um, because, like how Chris says, when you're in the middle of it and you're chanting the pieces. It's just very, very different than just being able to kind of soak it in. You know, it's like we had lessons and carols at my parish, and it was so nice just to soak it in and not have to kind of be like, what's next, and I've got to lead the show. It's really pleasant. Lessons and carols is another one of those things that that, that oftentimes we don't see. And as I understand it, Father, this kind of comes a little bit from the Anglican tradition, but there are roots, of course, in in Catholicism, the the notes uh, of kind of the keeping watch. The, the learning about uh, about the coming of our salvation and then singing carols to counterpoint what uh, happens in Scripture. Yeah, this this was actually invented for King's College in uh, Oxford, yep. and it was it was designed to be done on Christmas Eve as a feast of nine lessons, and each of those lessons, a, a reading from Scripture, would then be followed by carols, you know, caroling. And it was it was invented in 1880. And uh, since then, it, it just caught on as wildly popular. And now, unfortunately, it's moved up earlier and earlier. And so you're reading scriptures about, you know, on this night, and then you sing, Oh, Holy Night, and it doesn't make any sense. But it is a remarkable, you know, beautiful ceremony. And it's one of these things that the, the Anglicans really did give us a brilliant, yeah. you know, a brilliant thing. And some people will follow exactly what they do at King's College. Mm-hmm. Um, the one we do here is done by a really top-notch choir, and it's it's unbelievable. But uh, others prefer to kind of invent their own or to work on something different. But it's a, it's a beautiful way of celebrating by connecting Scripture and caroling, because, you know, caroling's an important part of our tradition. That's very correct. And, of course, if, uh, if you're listening to the Catholic Underground, you no doubt have heard our version of Lessons and Carols. And uh, you can uh, search that uh, at catholicunderground.com. And, of course, um, if you're listening on the radio in uh, on, on next week, we'll be running our Lessons in Carols episode. In fact, it, who knows? It may actually run for two weeks in a row. Um, That's for, true. For the 21st and the 28th. That way you can catch it uh, if you're listening to us on radio. Um, and, of course, if you, if you are watching us uh, on, on uh, Catholic TV, then uh, you can go to catholicunderground.com and, and take a listen. You can download it as a podcast, so that way whenever you're driving— You'll have uh, an advantage that I did not. I didn't have lessons in carols from Catholic Underground on my on my iPhone at the time, um, and so that is a real way to reach into the the depth of our tradition. Before the show, uh, Jeff was talking about I forget what I was talking about, but um, oh, it was about the Marian symbol, the M and the A uh, inter interconnected. Yes, uh, and and Jeff was talking about how gosh, there's still so much about this faith that I I just don't. <laughs> I just don't don't know. And I said, well, thus it will always be. Yes, you know, that's thus true. it will always be. Uh, Kathleen, did you go to an Advent mission at all? 
Um, I, I haven't. Yet. You have not yet? In fact, I miss, I was in New Orleans today for a Latin mass, my first one I've ever been to. Oh. oh. Um, it was awesome. Um, there's a lot of things where I was like, wait, what, 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 why do we, there's a lot of. Perfect. <laughs> there's a lot more movement than I expected, which made me go, I know there's a reason why we do that yeah. in this, in this particular mass setting. Um, but why? Hmm. Yeah. But anyway, some friends of mine were going to lessons and carols in New Orleans, um, and I missed it because I, I had to come back here. But These things do happen. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually gave a mission this year um, for one of my brother priests in the diocese, and it was on the promises of, um, uh, of God through the Scripture. So starting with Genesis and then moving all the way into the New Testament with, uh, with the, the nativity, uh, the notion of how God promised for us to be with him. That was the great promise. And it's fulfilled ultimately in Jesus Christ. And so that was uh, the three nights of the mission. That's uh, kind of what I took everybody through. And uh, lo and behold, they actually stayed awake through the whole thing and um, and were able to reflect back um, prayerfully what was being said. So I was... That's great. God was glorified and I was happy that I was able to be a, a holy tool, <laughs> you know, <laughs> a, a, a small shovel in the hand of the Lord. Oh my! Into the, into that great rich coal bin that is that is our faith, you know, to stoke the fires of the Christian faithful. Well, isn't that nice? Sure. If you can manage it, you are listening to the Catholic Underground. We are online at catholicunderground.tv. I am Father Chris Decker. Joining us via Skype, we have Father Ryan Humphreys, Jeff Blackwell, Kathleen Lee. Hey. We've got uh, Ed in the video cave, as well as Tim the Sim, seminarian intern. I don't know what we should call him now. Uh, Our picks of the week are coming up a little bit later. But first, we thought we'd talk about the breakthrough startup of 2014, because there have been, as there always are, a number of companies that, that start up, and then many of them fizzle out. But there is one such company that has stood the test of this year, especially in the midst of, of great economic difficulty, and it's Stripe, Father Ryan. Yeah, Stripe ended this year with almost a $2 billion valuation. Wow. Uh, which is not a bad deal considering that they started from nothing after PayPal was already established. Uh, and so what, what Stripe, Stripe is is an online payment system, just like PayPal. It's founded by two brothers from Ireland, Patrick and John Collison. And as I said, it's founded about 2009, about five years old. But the magic, what makes it different, because payments are payments, is that it's really friendly for developers. And so this is a code nerd kind of business. And they basically made it really easy, like the company that we've started using to uh, to take um, donations at Catholic Underground and at minorbasilica.org, which is called Commit Change. Mm-hmm. And it's really easy to make a payment. There's none of this, you know, sign in here and make a deal there and then attach that and then respond to this and then, you know, send a letter, you know, with a picture of your firstborn. Uh, it's it's incredibly easy to make a donation or make a payment. And um, Stripe has really done a good job of implementing it and making it easier on the front end and especially on the back end. And the best example of how they're blowing it out of the park is a company called Lyft, L-Y-F-T, which is just like Uber. It's a crowdsourced taxi service. But their payment system is dead simple. It's incredibly easy. You type your information in, you put the amount you want, click, you're done, and you move on. And really the moral of the story for, for Stripe is that sometimes the front-facing uh, facing parts of the service really do matter less than the rear-facing parts. But it's got to be simple. It's got to be usable. Yep. And whereas PayPal had gotten so bloated, Stripe was able to come in and – and now they're the ones who Apple decided to pair with over PayPal. And they're the same ones that Squarespace uses for all their commerce. That's how I got connected with them. Oh. And, y'all, it is a top-notch service. So it's not an infomercial for them, but it's easy to see why it's successful because they've stripped everything they didn't need and they've made what they do. They do it really well. And that's really what we've, we've spoken about uh, many times on, on our show is is in the business space um, in the same way that that we um, as as Christians are called to do what we do and do it well. And the more someone is drawn in by by the beauty and the simplicity of of what we do, um, the more likely they are to to want to continue and to to go deeper. You know, um, yes, I did just make that connection, uh, but, but but also, but 
in in as much as as the way that um, that that we connect ourselves to to what is beautiful matters in our faith it also matters in things of the earth too because we're drawn to those universals we're drawn to to things that that work well we're drawn to symmetry and that sort of thing hmm. um and and i think that uh, that good businesses um tend to reflect that in some way even if they don't know they're doing it in a you know Christian context. That's the beautiful uh, thing about it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, well Father Ryan, I've, I've had an issue because I had uh, a couple of websites. One was like uh, uh, Souvenir Gear, um, and um, and I always had problems with uh, the uh, like the, the shopping cart and the checkout yeah. system. Uh, then on my present website, even though it, it's been up for about a year and I haven't sold the first thing, and it's not really anything that I push, um, but, um, still, I, I have it linked to PayPal, so it, it is a little bit simpler. How about somebody who has, uh, let's just say like my daughter, for example, uh, makes knickknacks and she wants to, uh, to sell them, uh, with her own website. Is this something that she could actually set up? Yeah, it's, it's designed to be really, really, you know, simple on both ends. And so if she's working on something like, you know, WordPress, then that's easy to do. If she's on Squarespace, it's automatic. Oh, okay. uh, it's all built in. And so, I mean, Squarespace at $8 a month, you click a button and it just works. And it's, nice. it's really nice. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. I, and, and that's kind of a neat thing too, is that a lot of these services um, are, are making little modules that integrate on into websites. Um, so all you have to do is kind of add it in as a widget or something like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and that's a, that's a really neat thing. And, uh, as we've learned with, uh, with the way that we collect donations for Catholic radio and Catholic underground mm-hmm. is if, if you stay on the window and you don't have to mouse somewhere else I and, love it. and load times are, are nothing, right. then more, more than likely a person is going to say, well, I'm going to stick with this. I'm going to order the service. I'm going to get the knickknack or you know what your daughter might also uh, consider is something like Etsy, which is um, which is basically like um, eBay, but for stuff that you make. So it's your own little marketplace, right? right. And that's it's all. Like that's all integrated. Yeah, that's there. Yeah. that's an ideal place yeah. for that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So that's uh, that's kind of neat. Etsy. All right. That's right. So dead simple is in. In fact, Kathleen, one of the things that you might have noticed about about uh, the the extraordinary form is the simplicity of it. Yeah. Even though it's intricate, it's simple. It is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's no like. It was like, oh, let's sing some songs and not have, you know, it was just voices. Mm-hmm. You know, or let's say, you know, it w- yeah. The music led you somewhere. Yeah. Right. Even though there was a lot of movement, it was it was very simple. So to all you Catholics out there who are considering a startup, maybe maybe attend a nice, beautiful, simple mass. And that could give you, you know, a little inclination. I don't know. I don't know. Or come to Natchitoches, and I'll, I'll be happy to walk you through it. That's right. Father Ryan will walk you through every, oh, every blissful step. I'll teach you how to write it all in PHP or, or Ruby. Road trip. Yeah. Just not Java. Never, <laughs> no, not, ever, ever Java. No. Oh, no. Java tomorrow, Java yesterday, but never, ever Java today. Never, okay. ever Java. Let's just get that straight. Whoa. In other news... Uh, natural family planning. You may have heard about this. Maybe the first and last time you heard about it was at your pre-cana before you got married. But uh, natural family planning has an unexpected new friend in the millennials. Um, yes. in, in fact, I personally think that natural family planning is is a wonderful gift to to the church, and um, and even the the different uh, outcroppings of that, the Creighton model mm-hmm. and and that sort of thing of, uh, of natural family planning. And the millennials, who who tend to get a bad rap, I think um, I'm I'm right on the cusp. I think I'm considered a millennial. Yeah. Even though I would I would identify a little more with Generation X. Mm-hmm. Personally, I'm a millennial. Yeah. But yes, you did hear that right. Hipsters are starting to get excited about natural family planning, and <laughs> what's even more exciting is they're bringing their newfangled hipster tech to the party. That's right. Yeah. Hey, if you got hipsters, if they're going to be wearing the Martin Landau glasses for Mission Impossible. <laughs> They might as well bring their iPhones, too. Right. And so, you know, yeah. So there's a couple of things out there that um, that are, are kind of popping up. Um, one of them is Startup Daisy, and it uses a small uh, Bluetooth device to measure your temperature. Oh, that's neat. Mm-hmm. Oh, come and on. then um, and the Lady Comp. <laughs> I love these names. <laughs> We're so uh, that's what I love about girl stuff is if we can fit a flower in there. Or oh, yeah. Late. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Do you the, know I did a graphic design for somebody who who is a, a woman who owns a, a business, mm-hmm. right? 
and uh, it's an environmental business. Okay. Hmm. And uh, this was I was doing this work uh, through somebody for somebody, you know. Right. And I did. I was like, oh well, well, let's kind of give it a a beautiful feminine edge. Mm-hmm. And so I did. I incorporated. Um, it might have been a leaf, or it might have been a flower, or something. Yeah. And uh, lady said, nope, nope, too ladylike. Wow. Bam, gone. Wow. It was the first time that I had designed something feminine that that a woman looked at and went, nope. No. Normally, like oh, you have in cap, you have captured yeah. it beautifully. You have you have a feminine touch. Exactly mm-hmm. right. Yeah. yeah. Where's like the logo shovels? whisperer for ladies? Yeah. But no, oh, not not for this. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We don't, we don't want any of that. <laughs> anyway, so, anyway, so yes. Yeah. So start up Daisy. It, you take your temperature. This little thing that you. It's like a little guitar pick. I think it almost looks like. Oh. Um, and then there's the lady comp algorithm um, to calculate fertility via an iPhone app. Hmm. So there's another thing called Cycle Bees uses something similar, um, but both show quote success rates above ninety percent. Oh, hmm. yeah. So of course, NFP charting apps uh, abound with Clue for iOS and Avu View. <laughs> oh, <laughs> for Android, <laughs> oh. Um, yeah. taking the lead in popularity. These are the most popular ones. Um, this Daisy. Method, I guess. Yeah, yeah the, it's, the monitor. It's pretty pricey. It's about four hundred dollars. Oh my! You know, um, Cycle Bees has a yearly um, and maybe a, a one-time purchase of under thirty. Clue and Avu View are actually free apps. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of things, and I've seen them kind of popping up. You know, it used to be that you, you, you know, you charted, and and every morning you had to figure it math and graphs, and and this, this Daisy thing is interesting. Yeah. And it has really little cool color codes, and, and basically you're taking your temperature. Yeah. And, and every guy who sees it is going, ooh, Bluetooth. Right, right. Yeah. The guy who says yeah. Bluetooth, and, and, and the, the woman who used it is going, oh, possible fertility. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. typical yeah. guys, huh? Yeah, I want to have a baby, but that thing's got Bluetooth. Oh, yeah. man. Let's, let's give it. Yeah. Can I, will it work on me? Let's see what happens. Work on me. Let's try it on me. That's right. Uh, I'll take, take my temperature, temperature with <laughs> Let me say what I am. Yeah, but these are really cool because you know a lot of a lot of young adult women um, are saying this whole chart. The whole problem with the the any kind of charting is that it t- it's too difficult, quote unquote. You know, and, and it's hard to get into. I'm, uh, this is easy. It, some of these methods, you just you know take your temperature, plug it in. There you go. It can predict when your next cycle is. Um, sometimes a little, it's a little creepy, <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, it, how it, do you know that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and, and it's, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. The things that are out there. Yeah. Um, one in the, the, the chat room and I don't know anything about, um, uh, Angelica in the chat room says, uh, that another one that she's aware of is glow. Hmm. Yeah. Which is a, uh, is also a, um, a, an ovulation tracker. I don't, yeah. I don't know anything about it. Yeah. Um, we, we always try to keep to those that, uh, that, that support life, yeah. you know? Um, and, uh, I, I don't know. That's the, that's always the, the question about natural family planning Yeah, is, is, what you know, you? what is an FP yeah. and is it some straw man like the rhythm method that you heard about in the seventies, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting yeah. that, you know, an article that I was reading about it was like, you know, so, you know, Sally, you know, takes her temperature every morning now to see if she can, you know you know, with her boyfriend. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not what it's made for. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Let's go back. And so, you know, there are women who are using it for, you know, and, and it was an interesting article because it talked about, um, you know, how relationships are now and there are these like pseudo marriages um, that people are planning, quote unquote, families. I'm like, yeah. but, they're, but you're not, yeah. you know. Um, but but it does make it a lot easier for women. Sure. Um, there's a good and a bad to it, and and well, and but that's it's the how thing. you it's how you use it. But that's the thing is is as we believe as Catholics, if you're remaining open to life, this simply gives you a, a kind of a a continuum, yeah, that can help you um, in your discernment of life, mm-hmm. you know, in, in your discernment of of, uh, of of kids and and of being open at the whole time to yeah. life, but at the same time realizing that that there are times in the body. That are more um, more fertile than others, and that sort of mm-hmm. thing, and and that isn't necessarily um, just completely. That's it's not contraceptive. Um, yeah, I'm sure that you probably could use natural family planning in a contraceptive method, mm-hmm. but as we learn, Father, with uh, with moral theology, that really it's it's all about your intent whenever you use uh, something like natural family planning. 
Right. I mean, it, it, it ultimately is the same. Any any technology that helps you know more information or prevents birth or whatever can be used for moral or immoral reasons. Now, barrier methods, you have a very, very narrow window of what can be used morally for those. Right. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, you can and it, a person using NFP or claiming to use NFP can be just as anti-life as somebody using condoms and a birth control pill. Yeah. Um, mm. it, it's a function of am I do I want to do and be into the mission that God has created for me as a married person or not? And that doesn't just mean have unlimited children, but it does mean am I really trying to put myself under the mission that God has created for me? Because yeah. there is a mission inherent to the family life. Yes. Or am I not? And and like you say, the intention is a big part of it, and the effort to conform oneself to the will of God is a big part of it. And everything else really does kind of just become details. Right. And and if, if, in all things, if you were like uh, Paul's letter to the Thessalonians um, for Gaudete Sunday, if we are conforming ourselves to the will of God in all things, um, then then everything else is going to work itself out. Because if we are constantly conforming ourselves to God's will— then we begin to receive the fruits of that. Huh? Sometimes the fruits of that are born in the midst of a, of a crucifixion of, of, of great difficulty, but, but the fruits of the Spirit that are joy and that are peace are always going to be born from conforming our, our will to God's will. And it's only then that we actually can begin to live virtuously, right? We, we live virtuously, we avoid vice, we receive fruit of the Spirit. And, and part of that fruit of the Spirit um, is the joy and the peace that comes from from new life being born within our families? So yeah, um, in fact, uh, in regards to um, to glow, uh, Angelica said that uh, that she is um, she's she's using this app, and um, after a miscarriage, she said that she was desperate for knowledge, and it helped. Um, and she says she has a two year old and one on the way. Yay! So, All right. So blessings to you, Angelica, and we wish the best for you and for your family. That's really, really awesome. And I really, I like the fact, uh, Kathleen, that new technologies can actually help us yeah. in in being being more Christian. Yeah. I mean, that's that's part and parcel of what we do with the Catholic Underground is to raise up those things mm-hmm. that are helping us to live life uh, as a Christian. Um, even in the same time that we have whatever it is, might be Bluetooth, you know. But to right. be able to Did be, you say Bluetooth? I love Bluetooth. <laughs> 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 yep, I did say Bluetooth. All right, I sure did. And uh, of course, um, you are listening to the Catholic Underground. Yeah, this. Uh, this radio, television, podcast cavalcade just continues on with its chicanery. Yeah, cavalcade. Ah, oh. like a wagon train to the stars. Ah. <laughs> oh. Speaking of stars, I'm Father Chris Decker. I'm kind of a big deal in yes. most of Thailand. And, uh, <laughs> you're welcome, Planet Earth. Oh, my. Also joining us, uh, <laughs> he's big only in Papua New Guinea. It's Father Ryan. <laughs> Well, I'm big pretty much everywhere around the middle and not really anywhere else. <laughs> They're here. It's kind of a donut situation. <laughs> yeah, it really is. <laughs> what are you going to do? Also, Kathleen Lee. Hey. She's, well, she's, she is, Um, I don't know. What What don't, can you say about Kathleen? I was about to say, don't say anything about Kathleen. She's a youth big. minister. <laughs> she's a youth minister. I'm not a youth she's minister. Big youth <laughs> I'm not a witch. I'm your wife. Stop <laughs> <laughs> a dick. And Jeff Blackwell, Yay. the HD version. Here, That's right. Okay. Je- Jeff is available in in uh, in sixteen by nine as well as four by three. Wide everywhere. Okay. That's right. Okay. Enough, of, enough of these jokes here. Uh, I, I find myself um, with with a little bit more uh, a little bit more of my diocese <laughs> these days <laughs> as we <laughs> as we get into the Christmas season. Our picks That's of the week good. are dangerously close. But first, we want to talk about four ways that college students can evangelize on campus. And you know this happens. You you finally break out of the house, Kathleen. Yep. You graduate high Run school and you go, "I'm going to make a name for myself." Mm-hmm. And you go to college and uh, you encounter something that perhaps you've never encountered before, that your faith is your responsibility. It's your business. Mm-hmm. And um, and we know that, uh, like our Catholic Student Center at uh, Louisiana State University, as well as uh, the University of Lafayette, mm-hmm. uh, are, are and Southeastern. These are all within our own state of Louisiana. Uh, a number of Catholic Student Centers that are very vibrant. And so we thought we'd talk a little bit about the four ways 
um, from St. Peter's List, a college student can evangelize on campus. Because assuming you, you are Catholic and maybe you were involved in youth ministry in high school and you want to continue that and take, take your faith by the horns and say, I will be Catholic. Number one, start with the beautiful. And we talked about this a little bit before when we were talking about making beautiful apps, right? And, and maybe modeling that on some of the beauty that we see in, in the liturgy. And um, this, is, this is one of those very basic philosophical constructs that, that underpins who we are as Christians. Um, beauty, first of all, is non-threatening, right? Can we agree with that? If something, yeah. take, take a look at Kathleen's iPhone 6. It's just, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. You know, it's got rounded edges, rounded corners, you know, and it's non-threatening, non-threatening. And so beauty breaks into its uh, into our lives um, without even noticing. We we don't even notice it. If we see something nice, we go, "Oh, that's really nice." We do. Um, it's captivating. It's awe inspiring. And as Catholics, Mother Church uh, gives us really a lot of the greatest, most beautiful things we've ever known. We talk about um, Scripture. Scripture is beautifully written, especially the Gospels. The Gospel of John is beautifully written. Um, our liturgy, uh, generally speaking, our liturgies are made to be beautiful. They are made to witness to something greater than themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, the liturgies are made to witness to something greater than themselves. And, uh, of course, uh, I know, Father, um, as we went, we just got back from Italy a few months ago, we saw some of the most beautiful sacred art that has ever been created to glorify God. Right, and it, it, even even those who are not religious just look at it and go, this is astounding. Yeah, it reminds you know, it, me of the story uh, of when Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, went to Mexico, uh, Mexico City, to the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And she's touring it, you know, and because she's a Secretary of State, she gets this up close mm-hmm. of everything. So mm-hmm. they put her father in front of the tilma of Juan Diego that's still after these many hundreds of years is is still just as vibrant as it was um, the day that that it was given as a gift to Juan Diego on his tilma, yeah. and and uh, Hillary Clinton is is peering at this, you know, and she looks closely at it, and she turns to the rector of the basilica there, and she says, "Well, who painted this?" <laughs> and the rector looks at her, looks at the other bishops, <laughs> dumbfounded, looks yeah. back at her, and he goes, "God." <laughs> <laughs> So beauty is what it is, right? Yeah. It, it always speaks a language of its own. Yeah. And, and so uh, we would say as Catholics that the best way to experience that is, is the Mass because it is heaven on earth. It's a little peering through the veil, if you will, as, as I like to say. And so as a college student, start with the beautiful, right? Um, this means as a college student, you can uh, maybe choose your own courses where you will look at art and literature and music. And uh, these are things that you can choose as a college student right now. Even if you want to become a doctor or if you want to become, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe you want to become a a botanist. But you can begin in those first four years of undergrad, you can begin what we would call a classical education on your own. Isn't that right, Father, this notion of a classical education? Yeah, I mean, just the notion of being trained in that which is good, that which is true, and that which is beautiful, yeah. you know, is, is the foundations of all of kind of what we would now call liberal uh, arts, you know, and so, yeah, learning about the beautiful and then being able to create that which is beautiful. I mean, you know, we we here have lessons and carols, and we have we had a big concert of sacred music on the Feast of on, on the All Souls Day, and we had lots of non-Catholics who came who were edified by the beauty of the whole thing, you know, and, yeah. and that works on college campuses as well. So many college campuses have ugly chapels and they just want to play whatever praise and worship song came off the, the latest passion album. And, you know, you're like, but if you do something beautiful, if we do something beautiful, it will have so much more impact than if we just do what every other Catholic or every other student union is doing. Yeah. Beauty has a way of speaking in a way that other things don't. That's right. In fact, uh, Ryan in the chat says, you know, the truth can be very threatening and the truth is often beautiful. And I think that there's something about that, too, is that sometimes uh, we are threatened by what is not the status quo. Mm -hmm. And and whenever we do come come face to face with something that is uh, we can use the phrase terribly beautiful Mm -hmm. because it it in a sense, it terrorizes the notions that I have of what is not of God. Mm-hmm. And so those have to be wiped away. Those have to be wiped away so that uh, so that I can actually move forward in what is good, true, and beautiful. Yeah. So anyway, number two is is witness through life and community of friends, and uh, and and that is that is one of the things that that we can we can see too. Um, I, I will I will bet that if you're if you're watching us uh, on video, 
that this is what you're going to see. Um, hopefully something beautiful, right? Um, the second thing is, is witnessing through your friends, uh, making sure that you're cultivating good, true, and beautiful uh, uh, relationships, too. That's very, very important. And so uh, we're called to do that in, in our relationships with one another. And, and I know uh, it's, it's often difficult whenever we're in, um, in a college setting to, mm-hmm. to cultivate those relationships, yeah. But but Kathleen, we've still got to do it, right? Yeah, and I think they're there. You just have to you just have to find you have to work at it. You have to be purposeful. Yeah, you know, because you're not you're oftentimes not. You know, if you're coming from a high school, maybe you're coming from a Catholic high school. Yeah. Um, where everybody had kind of the same thoughts. Everybody was doing the same thing. Everybody's going to the same you know youth group events. Um, and it's not that way. It's not that way when you get to college because things things get a little different. That's right. Um. It's it's tough. I I know being kind of in a bubble in the seminary as I was, uh, I actually cultivated good relationships, you know. Yeah. Um, but I I can imagine that it's not easy. And, and Father, one of the things that that can be done is uh, is to tap into other groups that are already there, like the Catholic Daughters, the Knights of Columbus, um, uh, having a group to go to mass with, or even one of the sodalities like at your parish. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, connecting with those groups that are on campus, those groups that are designed to minister, or just having a group of friends who who minister through what they don't do. Maybe we don't go get drunk or don't get high, yeah. or through what we do. You know, like I, several of my friends when I would just kind of sit around the quad uh, with our guitars and we would just kind of write music and be, you know, kind of just weird. And um, and it was great because, you know, we'd, we'd come across a cool song and, uh, you know, and people would kind of just join us and hang out. Yep. Same sort of thing that the Inklings did in Oxford. They would sit That's at right. the pub and they would read this amazing literature and people would just kind of be there or not be there, just fall yeah. into or out of. And that's an incredible, an incredible opportunity that a lot of campuses don't offer. That's right. Uh, I, I know um, there, there are a couple uh, of Catholic student centers that actually have a, uh, a coffee shop, if you will, uh, that actually sells, that dispenses and sells coffee. And, and that can be a good meeting place, too. Mm-hmm. I, I, Father Ryan and I have, have had this idea for, for many years to have, actually, if there's a parish that's in a center, like a, a cathedral downtown or something, to have something called the Parish Grounds. Oh, yes. You know, uh, an <laughs> actual <laughs> functioning coffee shop. Like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah patent pending. Uh, number three is articulate Catholic teaching. This is a, kind of a no-brainer. If you are Catholic, if you were going to college, then we're also called to, to, to stand up, as First uh, Peter 3 says, always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have, but do it with gentleness and respect. Um, oftentimes, um, we can be bombarded in college with uh, those who maybe don't want to be respectful about the Catholic position, but it doesn't mean that we respond in kind. It means that uh, you as a Catholic have a responsibility to, to learn what you believe and to teach what you believe, um, even if it's kind of in a simple way by saying, well, that's not actually what we believe about Mary. That's not what we believe. Uh, would Would you like to hear what we believe? You know, that sort of a thing. It doesn't have to be threatening. Well, and so many of the really great uh, saints yeah. would always respond to those kind of people. Like Fulton Sheen was famous for it. Some yes. would say, you believe this, you know, or are there you Catholics, you believe this, that, the other. And he would kind of turn, and he was, of course, very quippy, but he was able to say, you know, the Catholic Church has never been tried, you know, sir. It's it's been It's been made fun of and assaulted, but it's never been tried, you know, or something like that. And and even if you just have a good answer like Cardinal Burke often does, yeah. when someone will say something, he'll go, well, actually what the church believes is this. And he'd say it simply and kindly, and they kind of are left going, oh. Yeah. You know, and and, and that's that's challenging. But, I mean, that's a really good thing to develop, that kind of, of spirit of just saying, I want to help people. Yep, exactly. And then uh, following for flowing from that is charity. Be charitable. Uh, be a person who actually uh, reaches out to others. You know, um, oftentimes there are a lot of opportunities for charity on your college campus, um, whether it's uh, whether it's helping to uh, to help those who are confused about what the church teaches, or if it's actually some form of uh, of social justice project where you're going and helping to to feed those who have no food, going to to give shelter to the homeless. A lot of Catholic campuses uh, do have those kinds of outreaches too, and charity is very important because charity, more than anything else is a sure way to, to nick off the, uh, the, the vice of pride. And, and the college student, um, just like the adult, 
is almost always able to be inclined towards pridefulness and pridefulness mm -hmm. it kind of brings you into where wanting to to comfort yourself and to become maybe gluttonous or lustful it's all rooted there so if we act charitably then it can become the root for a really good college experience and so uh, so there you go four ways we'll uh, put a link in the show notes to St. Peter's list and the article there and then finally, as Christmas nears, we want to spend very a very small amount of time here talking about the importance of singing carols. We talked about that a little bit at the top of the show. And Jeff uh, Jeff likes to sing when no one's looking. Yeah, typically in the shower, <laughs> and you know that's right. It's the top forty in really the shower, right? Hear me either. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there's a there's a great link in the show notes at CatholicUnderground.tv. Uh, ccwatershed.org um, had a blog about the importance of singing carols. So yeah. I don't know if you noticed uh, how old hymns and carols seem to put so much deep theology and poetry into their words. Um, but but think of uh, like the carol, Oh, Come All Ye Faithful. Uh, I mean, it, when you really get down to it, it's pretty deep. Yep. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. How about the, the words, uh, Long lay the world in sin and error pining, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Woo, yeah. man! It's it's a homily. Put in your a song. hand on the radio. That's right. Uh, but uh, uh, seriously, the uh, and you got me to thinking about this. Uh, what is the difference between carols and hymns? Mm. But um, the the really the depth of spiritual theology is the words and the fact that the tunes are so ingrained in why we sing hymns to begin with. Right. Uh, and it's to teach and reinforce. Well, at the same time, kind of entertaining and uh, delighting uh, folks. So. Um, I found this little article. In fact, I googled, what is the difference between carols and hymns? Well, hymns are traditional poems or songs which have been taken from the book of Psalms and are hundreds of years old. Carols could be as old as the Middle Ages or as new as today. Uh, and In fact, there's new Christmas music coming out uh, most every year. Uh, but hymns have a particular music called chordal. Father Ryan, mm -hmm. jump in there anytime you want, because you you know more about the music aspect than I do, Cordell, but carols have traditional music or more modern and popular music uh, attached to them, yeah. to the words. Yeah, carols are typically based on folk melodies, mm -hmm. whereas hymnody tends to be based on sacral melodies, which there are not are. usually overlying. Um, interestingly enough, a lot of, of uh Sacred melodies tend to be in the minor modes as opposed to yeah. uh, a lot of uh, oh, the folk yeah. modes and major modes, but that's nerding out a little hard. For, for example, yes. for example, okay. Put it on me. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Traditional uh, folk tune. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, how a rose are blooming. Lo, how a rose are blooming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not yep. necessarily. It's, it's a hymnody. Yeah. Of course, mm -hmm. I think Lo actually may be also another traditional folk hymn, but it's, but it's, it's been altered a little bit for, yeah. yeah well what makes it really neat is that is too that you know given how cheesy a lot of folk music is nowadays carols introduce a level of musical complexity that we actually need because if all we're listening to is miley cyrus yeah. and taylor swift's god awful new album <laughs> it's louisiana could, baby it's not cold outside yeah. <laughs> well, we, but we could we could use the kind of sophistication yeah. that comes in in singing something like oh holy night or silent night because even though they're not yeah. hard to sing there's a musical sophistication there that you don't get from imbibing the filth that we usually mm. imbibe day yeah. after day. Yeah. So carols have a big part to play theologically, intellectually, spiritually, as well as culturally. Yep. Because what we sing influences what we believe. Okay? True. Whether it's Very popular true. music or, or sacred music, it's it's a surefire way, which is why the Lord uses it, right? Uh, when it was Paul says, hymns, Canticles, inspired songs, that's what we should use to pray, certainly, part, mm -hmm. part and parcel of our prayer. Satan also knows it, which is why ha, true. popular music uh, true. can sometimes turn you in a different direction. It's also why it's really peppy. You, know? you may have heard your grandparents saying that as you played the Beatles record backwards. You know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, my, one of my favorite hymns, Lo, How a Rose Are Blooming. Um, I also like... Uh, um, oh, gosh, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, oh, Holy Night's one of my favorites. Yeah. Uh, uh, the words are pretty hefty. You got a favorite hymn? There? I do. I, I I was in choir in high school, and it's kind of a, it's kind of my thing. <laughs> but um, my favorite is "Let All Mortal Mortal Flesh." Oh yeah. Silent. And the beautiful thing about "Let All Mortal Flesh" is that it's it's almost quasi Christmassy because it speaks about the incarnation, yeah, mm -hmm. as well as the Eucharist. Yeah. How about you, Father Ryan? Adeste Fidelis, so come oh, all yes. you faithful, uh, and and O Holy Night for its incredible theological depth. But uh, but yeah, Adeste Fidelis in Latin just has such an explosive. 
you know, sense of joy about it. And it's always sung on, you know, midnight mass at the end. And it's just great mm, exploding yeah. out. That's wonderful. Just wonderful. I have to remember to put that in midnight mass. I'm not sure if we sang it last year. You must. We must. But first of all, we must do this. We it's shout. the CU pick of the week. I saw three ships come sailing in is, uh, is Bobby's favorite. You have to be very careful on the radio when you say that. Yeah, right. slowly. All righty, okay. So, picks of the week, uh, Jeff Blackwell, go. All right. Now, this goes back to the 1900s, but uh, uh, 1940s, uh, uh, you know, radio theater was very, very popular because there was no television. Uh, well, uh, CBS Radio Mystery Theater uh, revived some of the that style uh, back in the 1970s. In fact, it was uh, 1974. And and I was dri- this weekend, I was uh, taking a little journey, a couple hours drive, and I thought, man, it'd be great to hear one of those things. And my wife says, hey, I'll look it up for you. Sure enough, there is a site for um, CBS Radio Mystery Theater available streaming and downloading. They have 1,399 episodes, and they're well done. I think most kids today would go like, oh, this is boring, but it's like about 42 minutes. And, um, it's got some sound effects and music with it, but it's all about the storyline. Um, and this it actually started off being hosted by E.G. Marshall and later Tammy Grimes, directed by Hyman Brown. And he was one of the directors from the 40s who, who uh, took charge of this, and it was on for a few years. So uh, check it out there the, uh, in the show notes. It's actually uh, cbsrmt.com is the link if you're interested. This is really cool, Jeff. There's I some neat stuff say. there. Yeah, because I, I, like, I like radio dramas. And uh, and to be able to listen to some of these, and they were all well written. These were the same guys yes. who started writing for television. Yes, that's you true. Know? That's and, very and so true. So really, really well written. So well, very- and well known actors. Of course, you just hear their voices. You really don't know who they are until they get to the credits at the end. That's right. And if you ever want to hear the mid Atlantic accent in its prime, listen yeah. to these old time radio things. Well, Kathleen, I believe you should have some pics of the. I sure do. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, um, I, one of my fa- one of my favorite musicians is a guy named Dave Barnes. Um, and he's uh, out of Nashville, and he does, I, I don't know how to, what you would call his style, but recently he's kind of stopped, he's, he's very Christian, um, and he, he really has, has gone back and done some Christian stuff, yeah. he's been touring, which is kind of strange, but, um, but anyway, he does these, these videos at Christmas, and he calls them Dave Barnes Christmas Extravaganzas, <laughs> and every year he's done one, and they're so funny, he's just funny, and it's just like, Three or four minutes of pure silliness, and it's just so good and clean. Um, one year, in fact, I have six of them listed, um, and it, the sixth one says um, Christmas Extravaganza 7, Part 7. Yeah. But one year, he stopped doing it, and he was like, you guys make the Christmas Extravaganza, and people Did. almost rioted. Oh, because- No, they were mm. like, don't ever do that again. <laughs> you scared us, Dave. <laughs> and they're just funny. They're just silly. And so, like, you know, every once in a while, especially as I'm teaching, when it gets to be this time it always gets a little crazy so these are for you when you're when you know you've shopped until you've dropped when work's getting nuts so when you're planning for everybody coming over and it just gets to be too much watch these they're just really funny just lighthearted. yeah and they're very he's so clean just just good i I think that that in in uh, a different time Mm -hmm. you know where children work together and build a giant cyborg you know yeah in that same land I would like to be able to have time to do these things. Yeah, they're but funny. He also has yeah. a karate lessons one, which is not Christmassy, but, but it's also karate. very funny. And his music is good, too. You should check it out. Dave Barnes. <laughs> Merry karate Miss. Merry karate <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Father Ryan, what's your pre-crimbo pick it awake? Well, you know, I've got an actual uh, book, a physical book printed on paper with words. Nice. It is the, oh, the, story, the story of English in 100 words. Ooh. And what he's done is chosen 100 English words and telling the backstory of where these words came from. Nice. And this should be the most boring book in the world, but it is a page turner. <laughs> uh, it is fascinating to hear where the word Lee came from or where the word pub came from or awesome. or why the word wicked meant a bad thing at one point, then it meant good, then it was bad again. That's good again in the 80s. It's just, it is fascinating. Uh, and it is, it's inexpensive. It's on the Amazon, but the story of English in a hundred words by David Crystal, you'll love every second of it. Wonderful book. Nice. That's awesome. My pick of the week is weird. <laughs> okay. I actually physically have it in mine hands and it's called the Pico Dolly. 
And uh, it is, uh, for those of you who are watching in Radio Land, uh, it is basically like a little mini skateboard, okay? And on the skateboard, skateboard is an arm, and the arm has a, a, a little dealie here, a little doofloch here, um, that you can that you can actually clip to your iPhone, or you can clip on a GoPro camera, or any camera that's not too weighty. And you now have a dolly, because it's on skateboard wheels, where you can get some really neat camera shots. And so for those of you in the video, we have uh, something that we recorded a little bit earlier um, of, uh, of this. And you can kind of see... It has a really nice smooth movement. So, yeah. So, if you're looking for, for something to get some really cool family videos this Christmas, you know, yeah. um, it's a, it's called a Pico Dolly. It's a little pricey because it's made of actual steel, I do believe. Uh, but, uh, I think it's aluminium. Uh, could be aluminium. Uh, it's, it's really, could uh, be. it's well constructed. Though. Yeah, it's very well constructed and uh, it'll last a while, I'm thinking. So, it's in the $75 range. This is one of my Christmas splurges. Um, but it's really useful if you do a lot of neat things with uh, with camera work, or if you want to start doing some neat things with camera work. So Pico Dolly is the name of it, and that is my pick of the week. Jeff, we always are grateful for those who support us, aren't we? Indeed, we are, especially those who uh, go to catholicunderground.tv, and you can either make a one-time donation or yep. sign up uh, for a monthly donation. Of course, it's the end of the year, and, you know, get those donations in. So, you know, we're tax deductible, you know? That's true. We are a 501c3. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Kathleen's excited about that. C3PO. And also, <laughs> portions, <laughs> portions of the Catholic Underground are brought to you by audibletrial.com slash catholicunderground. That's audibletrial.com slash catholicunderground. Yes, indeed. And if you want to join all of the many undergrounders uh, who are praying for us, you can find out more at catholicunderground.com. And if you are one of those undergrounders who can support us in some way financially, catholicunderground.com slash donate. All right. If you want the show notes uh, that accompany this episode as well as the podcast. This is important. Listen, folks. There will this, be a test. This is the place to do it. CatholicUnderground.com is the place to go. Uh, you can find out our Twitter handle. You can find out our Facebook information. Of course, if you're watching us on a video stream, it's probably on the screen right about now. Uh, and uh, you can find out all that information, especially the show notes, because we've talked about a lot today. And so you'll want to be able to... To, to kind of get in on that action. Mm -hmm. um, in mm -hmm. fact, uh, we might even be able to get Father Ryan to transcribe some of the stuff in the chat room, um, mm -hmm. that everybody's favorite hymns uh, that they've been talking about in there. So I'm just saying, you know. Anyway. All righty, Father Ryan's church is online at minorbasilica.org. He's at FR Humphreys on Twitter. Thank you, Father Ryan. It's been my distinct pleasure. You're a prince. Also, we've got uh, Jeff Blackwell. <laughs> He's the tech director of the CU and the ruling despot of the Blackwell Communications Group. He's uh, he's stringing up the holly, and we thank him, as always, jeffblackwell.us, and on Twitter at Jeff Blackwell. Thank you, Jeff. It's always a privilege, Father. Kathleen Lee is uh, the faith ninja. <laughs> She's speaking the mid-Atlantic accent all week. <laughs> hi <-ya. laughs> Kathleen, thank you for joining us. Anytime. Ed Ball is on the ball with our video feed this week. He uh, drinks fancy tea from unfancy teacups in his spare time. Thank you, Ed. And his assistant, Tim the Sim, seminary and intern, uh, is the holiday janitor over at the Mystery Shack, and we thank him for his presence with us. And you know me. I'm Father Chris Decker. You can follow me on Twitter at Digital Catholic. Join us on the interwebs at catholicunderground.tv for everything from the CU. Thanks for listening and hang out with us on the digital continent. We're CatholicUnderground.com, we're Faith Gone Digital, and we will see you next time.